it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. from East Tennessee, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Happy holidays. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be chatting with uh, Carrie Arnold from Bigfoot Odyssey. And Carrie's actually known for putting together some pretty cool documentaries. Uh, He was down there in Florida. The documentary is called 168 Hours. He was down there in Florida uh, with a bunch of investigators, and he filmed the whole thing. And it's available on YouTube. You can actually go watch it for free on Carrie's channel. And so we'll be talking about his documentary tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out uh, sasquatchronicles.com. Daily blogs. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Carrie to the show. Carrie, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Will. Yeah, and I know tonight we're going to be talking about your new documentary, 168 Hours on YouTube. And I'll actually put a link un- underneath this episode if people want to go and check it out. For someone who's never seen the documentary, tell us what if when they click on it, what are they going to watch? And then what were you trying to accomplish by creating this documentary? Well, what I wanted to do was get a bunch of researchers that didn't necessarily agree with one another, but were still had somewhat, somewhat a, a bit of a standing, I suppose, in the community together to work together to create a film, to spend 168 hours, which is one week straight in a place filming continuously, someone going out, someone coming in. That was the, that was the idea um, is to try to go and more than just trying to collect evidence was to show the process because you don't see a lot of that from researchers. There are a lot of researchers that go out and they film and they collect things and then they show people, but the process, what they're going through. And and you'll see some of that. Mark Newbill from Sawdust Beast uh, did a fantastic job of that. But, you know, this film is the first two days and not a lot happened. It was a lot of getting used to each other. And I mean, some, uh, some things happened. And you, you, you know, you'll get to see that, but there were, there were a lot of things that I had, I had to dig deep and grab a hold of some things like, like that Mark and Melanie Zasky had captured out, out there over the years and put in there the, the, some of the better things that I could find. And I didn't have a lot of the original clips. So all I had was, you know, this finished product. So I had to, I felt like I needed to explain some of it. It's a little ambiguous, I think. Uh, and I may even said, you know, for the most part. You know, a lot of people out there have a willingness to blind themselves to, to things they don't want to see or don't want to believe. But there's this other part that have their own idea 
of what these creatures should look like. So that's what they're looking for. And when they see something different, they're like, oh, no, well, that's just pareidolia. If you look at a lot of what's in here, you could probably say that. But if you if you stick to a specific criteria that I, that I actually give in the film, it kind of helps. And I probably should have outlined everything in it because there's no context to some of these things. You don't know how big it is. You don't know where you should be looking uh, when these things get shown. And maybe I probably should have done that with some of them, but I tried to show movement. You know, the, the very first one is caught, uh, he's 80 yards away. It's not like up close, but he's got his hand up on a tree. And then you, the next thing you see is pull his hand down. He turned his head a little bit, you know, pareidolia just doesn't do that. And then there's a video right after that. There's one right across the canal, 30 feet away, just poking his face through and he blinks but it's still not that clear. That's the problem is these creatures are just not going to give you very much. So we're working on equipment to alleviate that and to actually get, you know, the cameras they use like on NFL sidelines with a foot long lens that you can actually reach out and try to get something clearer because what we have, even what's shown in here is to me is decent. It's, it's okay. But it's just to, to me, it's a stepping stone. It's trying to get people used to this is what we're running into. This is what's leaving these tracks. This is what's make, you know, making these sounds and noises and got some good audio in it from that tree line. The very first night uh, you, we got them talking. Yeah, and I'll see if I can't play some of the uh, audio that you're talking about there, Carrie, for the audience to listen to. Uh, but if people want to watch it, uh, it's 168 hours on Bigfoot Odyssey on YouTube. And I know how much of a workload it really was, Carrie. You and I are friends off the air, and I remember talking to you. And you, you, I don't think I've ever heard you complain about work. But, you know, all these guys have different cameras, and then you're taking all of that and trying to create something cool, you know, create content out of that. And I know this is very different from the normal documentaries that you put together and actually put up on YouTube. Yeah, well, it took seven months to, to put together the first five months because it was 31 devices total. So from 31 devices, we got 2.6 terabytes. So that's what I had to go through and kind of get familiar with. And because when I make an Odyssey, normally I'd made 13 films before this. I have my camera and I have maybe another camera on the side, but it's just me and Linda or me and Brad. And I can know how it's going to flow. When I leave there, I know what I've got. With this, I had no idea. All I knew that what for sure what I had was what I filmed. And I had, you know, it was me and another cameraman filming these guys do their thing in the field and trying to, you know, to have some interaction and, and catch footage of something. You know, these creatures have a tendency to get far away from you, put something between you and them. But even then, they're just poking their head out. And that's, that's all you're going to get unless you can happen to walk up on one or get them to come to you and you go after them and we just, there wasn't a situation in part one where that really happened. You know, the, they have, they captured some things that I thought were really good. Um, you know, whether you're convinced by it or not is, is really going to be up to you. And I would remind everyone that when you go to YouTube and you turn it on, that you are defaulted to 480. You have to go into your settings every time you go to YouTube and put it on 1080. Now you don't have, once you do that, you can go every, every video you go to is in 1080, but once you leave and come back, you have to reset it to 1080p. So up the quality, if you're going to watch it on your phone, I would definitely set it to 1080. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that, Carrie, because I actually watched it in 480 on my phone. I just linked it right to my TV. And so I watched it and I'll have to go back and watch it in 1080p uh, because there's there is something I mean, I do have some critiques, but I think overall you did a really good job. And I've always been a fan of your work and your artistic ability to put things together. What were some of the biggest challenges doing this 168 hours outside of Bigfoot researchers killing each other? Yeah, well, you know, when you're dealing with that many people, it's like herding cats. You know, it's nearly impossible to know what's going on at all times. And I'm not a Bigfoot researcher. So there were people coming to me wanting to know, well, do you think this will be okay? And I'm like, just do your thing. 
you know, th- we had talked about this for over a year <laughs> of planning, you know, do your thing. We'll film you doing your thing. You know, whatever happens, happens. And, you know, we'll at least get to show that process. Uh, and like I said, the first film was, I just wanted to, I gave myself four guidelines essentially, because when you, like I mentioned before, uh, if anyone's heard, when you're navigating this landscape of this Bigfoot subject, there's no one path to take. They're infinite because there are more questions than answers. So when you're standing there looking across the landscape of the Bigfoot subject, you, there's no way you could aggregate every path and decide which one's the best way to go. Uh, what I decided I, that I could do, this is why I didn't know how it was going to end up, was just give myself a set of criteria, stick to them, and then the path would be what it was. People could follow it or not. And that was for it to be stable but dynamic, and that's hard enough. Moral and transparent. So as long as I stayed within all of those guidelines, I felt like how it turned out would be as good as it could be, as I could make it. Someone else might be able to do it better, but there was no reference to go by for this. I'd never heard of anybody trying it this way. It was a chore. It was five months of me just going through footage. When it was over, I did not feel good about what I had, what I had videoed. You know, I tried to get as much uh, insulary as possible, but as far as action went, I didn't know how it was going to go. And, you know, even though there were things that had happened, I was, I didn't know what it was going to look like. So leaving there was, there were a lot of questions. So, but for five months, I went through just going through footage. And then I think September the 25th, I drove 22 hours straight to South Florida to, to Mark's house and stayed there for five days, just starting to put this together. And because there were some other shots I wanted to get down there and I wanted to get a good interview with him. And that's what you're going to hear his voice in there and some of the things that he has to say, uh, which I thought was golden. Yeah, and I think everything is presentation. You know, on a Bigfoot show, you might get away with telling a story about Fran Ziegler and Charlie Brown has nothing to do with Bigfoot. If it's good, the audience will forgive you. If it's not good, they'll eat you alive. But everything is presentation, all how you present it. And I think with this, if the public is tuning in to see uh, amazing evidence of Sasquatch, that's not. this isn't the documentary for them. I think really this is a, a documentary about people and the people looking for um, Sasquatch. It's kind of telling a story from all these different researchers and why they're looking for this creature and kind of what they believe. And the amazing part is each one of them uh, has a different viewpoint of Sasquatch, but it really is more like a, a people documentary. Yeah, it's uh, like I said, the first two days, not a lot happened, you know, uh, we went out, the heat got to a couple of people in the, in the, the first expedition and there was just, there was no more going any further for them. I don't know if it was the heat that got to them, but it was definitely not helping. One of, one of the guys had, uh, was having really bad stomach problems, like cramping up really bad. And so it was only two or three hours out, but still found decent evidence got to get Mark Newbill. Thank God for him because he, he had the presence of mind to actually talk to the camera. And, and that's what I, that's what I wanted from everyone uh, instead of just the same old, Hey, let's go camping and then we'll go out and, and look around in this place and then come back. And what can people latch on to there really? So I was grateful for certain parts and that's kind of what you see. Um, I was, I was able to get some, some some of the well-known voices in in the community to narrate some stories. I got quotes. I got a quote from you. I got a quote from Ron Moorhead, and just tried to to make it something that the the layman could watch and understand. Yeah, let's play a clip. This is from uh, Carrie's documentary, 168 Hours. After deciding on the area for the first night expedition. All the teams decided they'd hit the trail, just so everyone could get a feel for the place and each other. The plan of attack was for the groups to split into two teams and go in from different angles, then meet in the middle, where the trail comes together. 
Yeah, you're gonna go straight to the crossroads, and then you're gonna stop and wait for us. Don't go any deeper in. Deeper in mm -hmm. means you're in where we've planned on going tonight to record them. That's where they stay, that's where they sleep. Stay at the crossroads and we'll be there. No one got off trail, but glassing with thermal and night vision from the trail did prove to be somewhat productive. Blake Deutscher from the Lost Cryptids Conservatory was using a psionics color night vision camera and happened to catch this red eye shine only 15 feet away. It appeared to be over eight feet off the ground. I've hunted for a long time and shined many animals' eyes, but have never seen any with red eye shine. I will say that red eye shine was a good catch. That was definitely creepy. Not much else was captured here, but what was captured back in the tree line by our camp was some very strange and interesting audio. Christopher Noel had placed a recorder in the tree line about 200 yards from our camp that first day. What was captured sounds like nothing I've ever heard before. This is the only night anything like this was recorded, but I believe it's because it's the only night no one was left at camp. This is what he recorded. It's weird. There's other animals you can hear going off, and, and probably Mark Zasky would know best because he lives there. He's there all the time. He could probably tell you what different animals there are, especially in Florida. I mean, it's the Amazon down there. Um, at some parts of that weird audio, it sounds almost mechanical. Did, did you hear that too, or do you get that impression? Well, it's, it's digital audio, and a lot of times the – the positioning of the camera and how the sound is hitting it is what's going to matter. So it's, it's, uh, that's the problem with the difference between analog and digital is sometimes you can get that effect. What people need to realize is this was a core recorder that was set out in the tree line by the camp. And the only night that anything like that was captured. Now you'll hear coyotes in it. What I think are coyotes barking, but what's underneath it, there's, there are other sounds in there, uh, and it was all condensed. So it wasn't like everything that was happening at once. So it was, this was everything that was found over that first night being out there. And it was the only night anything like that was captured because to me, I think it's because it's the only night there was no one left at camp. So I think they were, they saw us come in and get all this, you know, all these people were setting up tents and in this area. And then uh, maybe they were talking about it when we all left, but we didn't catch any more of that. The rest of the, the trip, you know, there were recorders out in different places and there were some things that you're going to get to hear that were captured because I had parabolics out. We had someone carrying a parabolic and then I had a parabolic that I had set out uh, in this area. So there are a few things that were captured on them, but they're distant. I really was glad we were able to catch what I think is them talking. It is just, you, you're not going to mistake it for anything else. It's not any other animal. You know, there are hogs out there, but this is not hog. This is 
it's just gibberish <laughs> for lack of a better term, but there are other, you'll hear things in there you will recognize, but that's only, that's only in there because there are things there with it that are just strange. Yeah. And I think throughout the whole documentary, there's definitely compelling evidence. I mean, is it groundbreaking? Is it going to shock the audience? No. Uh, but there absolutely is compelling evidence in there. And that's just my opinion. I mean, who cares what I think? Uh, I, I watched it. I enjoyed the documentary. It was cool seeing all the guys and having them talk about their experiences. But this next clip I'll play is the guys talking about the red eyes that you that you captured. You'll see it in the film. They look like eyes glowing to me, but the guys keep using the word eye shine. Um, and when Carrie interviewed these people, they are out in uh, the Florida swamp. For the audience listening, that's why you'll hear some wind when these guys are talking about this red eye shine. But let's take a listen. Night two had the team splitting up. Some would stay at camp and thermal the tree line because of the track and other activity the night before. David Todd and the Lost Cryptid team would head out to a known hotspot to do a separate investigation. Early on in the night, the camp team spotted something large in the tree line on the far edge of the field with the thermal cameras. That's about a 180-yard shot, and the tree is about 40 feet tall. Whatever that is, it's large. Jimmy, Josh, and a few of the others went out to try to get a better look. As soon as they got close, it vanished. They looked for a while, but nothing more was seen or heard. David and the Lost Cryptid team had a bit more eventful night. We rounded up everyone for a trip out there, and we were driving along the roadway. Uh, all of a sudden, Josh, Josh Parsons seen a red eye shine 10 feet up in the roadway, and uh, it basically turned and crossed the road. We all jumped out of the car as fast as we could, went into the woods. We started uh, hearing stuff, trying to follow it. Uh, we were tracking it as best we could. And basically, uh, we were hearing a little bit of uh, twig snaps here and there. We were moving around through the brush, investigating, and uh, the team members started seeing eye shine. I'd never seen the eye shine, but I fully trust these people with my life. I'm out here in the Florida swamps. Snakes, skaters everywhere. I, I trust these people. They're seeing eye shine. It's, it's 10 feet up, it's 8 feet up, it's up. It's up there. And it's moving, and we're, we're going after it. After a good number of minutes doing that, um, our buddy David uh, all of a sudden says, I, I don't feel good. We went out to an area that was uh, not far from here, a few miles down the road. Uh, lots of wildlife, uh, alligators, um, snakes, uh, spiders, uh, just, just about anything you can imagine. Um, was out there and we're out there after dark we're out there actually very late at night and in the middle of nowhere basically in the middle of Florida swamps um, so we did a night hike and we were uh, going through a lot of heavy brush um, on and during the hike uh, as, 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 as far as uh, showing up on the hike as soon as we got there uh, Josh uh, immediately reported that he saw some eye shine in the uh, in the woods, and and we stopped immediately and get out, and then we heard uh, some rustling around twice, like there was something very large that had moved from that area uh, through the woods. So we kind of drove a little bit in, off of off of the main road, down a service road, and uh, we jumped out immediately. The brush got thick. Uh, we were you know slogging through stuff at the beginning of our. Um, second time that we were out of the car, we didn't really have too many incidents. Um, we were hearing some owl hoots, but as we got to the end and we started to make our way back to the car, that's when the kind of the peculiar thing started because we all got disoriented. That was uncharacteristic of them to get turned around like that. Granted, we're in unfamiliar terrain and topography, but that was uncharacteristic. We were looking at maps the whole time, so it was it started to get a little bit everyone started to get everyone's everyone's level of anxiety started to rise um so we decided to go down a little bit farther and go into the woods we tracked through the we tracked through the swamp we tracked through the um through the woods we found a nice area where there was uh that was dug up as like a little pit where a larger animal could hide in uh, that was very interesting but 
on the way out, um, we had some trouble getting out. Um, and that trouble was uh, just really interesting. Um, I was uh, following the group. I was the last person in the group. And we're probably maybe a quarter mile still in. Whenever I'm in, whenever I'm out in nature, I always, I, I don't take things joking around. If somebody says they're not feeling good, that, that to me is a serious thing because they could drop dead. Um, we could be a situation where we have to carry them out and not even four men could have carried him out of where we were. So that wasn't really an option. So it was, it was that my anxiety level went up. And so he says he's starting to feel ill and he's starting to lag behind. I don't know what it was. I don't know what happened. Um, but it was almost like I was put into a trance state um, where I started falling behind the group more and more and more and more um, to the point that I I tried. I, I wanted to say, hey, hold up, guys. Finally, I was able to say, hey, hold up, guys. And they were way ahead of me. Um, but uh, I felt... Um, you know, certainly not alone out there. There's something out there. And I, I think it was trying to lure me away from the group, from the rest of the people, because uh, I was the last person. That was pretty fascinating, hearing the guys talk about feeling sick and feeling disoriented. You know, they, they see this red eyes and they go in after it. And then to hear the guys talk about being disoriented and, and being ill. And I know Bigfoot researchers will go, well, that's infrasound. No one really knows if it's infrasound or not. But, I mean, it could be. Uh, but it was fascinating to see these guys experience that firsthand in the film. Um, I watched the film with someone who's really not into Bigfoot to try and get their perspective on it. You know, as opposed to me and and what I would see. And, you know, she was saying, well, I don't really see what they're talking about. I don't see any uh, faces. And, you know, there's a big circle around it and it's highlighted. And the argument she made was like, well, you could probably take that circle and move it to the left and there'd be four more faces there. It's a good argument, and and I'm not beating you up about it. I, I'm just saying, I, whenever I put together a different pre show, every show is a presentation, right? And so I try to look at it through the audience's eyes. I, I think, um, to your point, though, there is some images in there that move, and pareidolia generally doesn't move. The very beginning of the documentary, there's a really cool shot of one looking right into the camera, um, I thought that was a cool image. And, I, you know, one thing that I liked about it, though, Carrie, is there's a lot of heart I could tell you put into it, and a lot of time and effort, and I highly respect that. The, the thing I really liked, though, is you weren't trying to sell the audience on it and say, this is Sasquatch, you know, and you were kind of leaving it up to the audience. You kind of give a backstory of different uh, images and clips that were taken and then kind of leave it up to the audience to make up their own mind. Um, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a cool film. Well, you're going to get to see three or four where you can actually see movement. And, you know, Paradelia just doesn't tend to do that. Uh, you know, when the cameras, a lot of these cameras were static. They were sitting still. And then you would pan over to another spot. And there's one in there that I caught 30 feet away. He's a little troll. But you see his, it's all the criteria I talk about. The same bone structure, the soft features might be different, but... The, it's got symmetry, and it's got this apex cone-shaped head. So when you look at this, it might be a little blurry or fuzzy on the edges, but you can tell that a leaf is a leaf. It's not, not zooming into a dark spot and making a face out of it. You can still see around that, that here's this fern. The, the clearest shot in there to me is this green-faced guy. Richard Borchart got it. And I try to make it a teaching moment as much as possible because when I show people that image, they just don't see it. They see something else. They're actually looking at this pareidolia instead of looking at what's sitting there. But he's got a green face. <laughs> so we had to kind of research why does, why, what, what's going on with this green skin. But it's not exactly the same color. It's, it's off a little bit. It's like lima bean green. And, and I try to explain in there what I think is happening. 
and then show other animals where the same effect is happening to them because of this gray skin that they have. And there's different tones of gray. But when you have that, that if things in the achromatic spectrum, they tend to uh, receive other colors, such as the green foliage around. It's the perfect adaptation for camouflage to me. And I tried to keep it from being from a rational standpoint. You know, the rationality of a thing is not a valid argument against it existing. It's just a condition of it. You know, it may not seem rational to someone that there can be a creature out there because the evidence is is left wanting so much. Uh, but if you really look into it and get into and and you start just figuring odds out, you can look at this creature in two ways. You can look at it like most people do from a standpoint that they don't exist. So there's your fallback. Well, this this is just doesn't exist. That's why. This is the way it is. Or you can look at it from a standpoint that they do. And these answers tend to come a little bit easier of what you think might be going on. Well, why don't we find their bodies? Well, let's look at the creature. Is it, it must be a sentient thinking being to be able to hide and stay hidden so much. If they're predisposed to it, born in them, not something they're taught. I think if they were taught it, they would make more mistakes, but a creature that is predisposed to hiding, not wanting to be discovered is not going to leave one of their dead around for us to find. They're going to do something with it. And, and from my point of view, so if you, if you look at it from that standpoint, you know, these, these answers tend to start coming, but it's such a mountainous task to try to catch clear footage of one. They're just not going to come out where you can see them. So making something that's convincing is hard. It really is for the for the the average skeptic or the layman or even the person on the fence that might have had an experience. So we're not asking anyone to believe any of it. I don't. I think that's a lot to ask anyone. Like you used to say back in the day, <clears throat> it's hard to ask someone to but to believe something. It's hard to ask someone not to believe something. It's a it's in, it's an inception. You know, it's ingrained in us. We don't possess beliefs. Beliefs possess us. So what I did ask people to do was just pay attention when you're out there to the possibility and then maybe you can have your own experience. I don't want to convince you of anything. You'll be in it. So that was, that's that's a game I can win. Awareness is a game we can win. Proving this, there's just, I don't see it happening. Yeah. I feel like, um, I, my constructive criticism is coming across like, uh, very critical and I don't mean it to by any means. I did enjoy the film and you guys did get a lot of very compelling uh, evidence down there, without a doubt. And, you know, going back to what you were just saying, Carrie, you know, down there in Florida, you're right. I mean, it's it's hard to get a, a clear picture of a known animal down there, in Flor- especially in Florida, for God's sakes. Uh, you're basically in the jungle. Going back to what I was saying at the very beginning, one of the things I really enjoyed about the film was the journey. You know, these people talking about what compels them to go out and look for this creature. Here's a clip from 168 hours of the researchers talking about that. I have been actively researching Bigfoot for around eight years. And I am from West Tennessee. We mainly research in LBL, Land Between the Lakes, but I have also researched for uh, in 15 states everywhere from Florida to New Mexico. And this is what I enjoy doing is taking things that I learn in my own research area and see if I can apply them to different areas. Well, like I said, I used to be a personal trainer, so I was always very familiar with uh, biomechanics and kinesiology. And so, you know, when I was younger and I originally saw the Patterson Gimlin film, you know, I was always able to look at people walking and be able to tell them what exercises they need to do to correct their posture and, and just, you know, tell about biomechanics, what they need to work on and everything. So when I saw the movement in the Patterson Gimlin film, I could just tell it wasn't a person in a suit. I mean, just the way they walked. You know, a person can mimic the knee bends and the stride and the arm swings and everything, but they can't do it that fluid and that naturally. 
and you can just tell it's it's not a human being. I've been um, pursuing this subject and being a student of the Sasquatch species for 15 years, ever since I started going on expeditions with the BFRO, and I got completely um, bitten by the, by the bug back then, and I've basically devoted my life to this um, inquiry ever since then. After a couple of years of going on expeditions all over North America, where there uh, was a long history of sightings. My grandparents talked to me about it, both sides talked about it when I was younger. Um, so I had a little bit of a background on it, although never at the time seeing one, hearing one kind of, you know, still wonder. Uh, but as the years progressed, it was just something that never really, it was something that was always in the back of my mind. Anytime I would see anything on TV or, uh, you know, it could be anything that, that, uh, that had anything to do with the subject. It would always bring those those memories back up. Um, and probably eight to ten years ago, really got into it serious, like really trying to really trying to learn. Two or three years after the beginnings, really starting to try to get out in the field as much as I could and meet who I could. My grandmother had uh, an encounter, or I would like to say an encounter, in uh, Mississippi years and years ago, uh, growing up. That uh, sounds pretty Bigfoot-ish to me, so that got me interested. I've always been interested in cryptids and uh, any kind of paranormal story. As a little kid, it was just monsters in general, you know, Godzilla, King Kong, and then reading um, stories and stuff from ghosts and UFOs and all that, and then Bigfoot. Bigfoot was always my favorite. It was my, my number one thing I loved, and gorillas were the number one animal I loved, so... Uh, I just studied up and read and finally started having encounters. And... You know, as I'm sitting here watching this, Carrie, I'm, I'm thinking uh, anyone who's not in the quote unquote Bigfoot world or community, whatever they're calling it now, uh, people don't get along, especially researchers. It's almost like a religion. If you don't believe the way I believe, then, you know, it's, it's bizarre. Uh, but researchers don't get along. And, and that's a and that's a fact. And the fact that you got all these guys to go down there and no one died, everything went relatively smooth, is a miracle. Yeah, well, uh, when I was interviewing for this and I asked people, you know, if you want to go, call me, email me, you know, and we'll talk. One of the things that I really looked for was, you know, what is your motivation? What do you really want from this? And the ones that I felt were honest with me, uh, are the ones that I took. They don't all agree, and there were a lot of disagreements. Some of the best evidence we got that'll be in part two is of Noel and Chad Datema arguing. And you hear them, and Jimmy's holding the parabolic, and they're arguing, and 20 yards away, this thing yells at them. So <laughs> he could, you know, this creature was obviously sensing the tension of the moment, but there were several uh, conversations in there with people uh, of, of me saying, look, you don't have to like them. But we have a mission here. We need to put ourselves above petty differences and try to get this done. So there were several of those conversations uh, that, thank goodness for Brad Hatcher. Uh, you know, he's he executive produced and he's the field producer for Bigfoot Odyssey normally. And he uh, he kind of rose up that third day and and really started getting things uh, to people together and talking to people and and what what was expected for sure and keeping them on point because when you don't have a frame of reference, you just kind of tend to do your own thing. So directing it after a certain amount of time, it, it did, it became work. It, it was probably the hardest thing I can, I think I've ever done uh, and, and accomplished and actually got through. And I, again, didn't know I had gotten through and actually made something out of it until much, much later after it was all finished. Yeah, I hear you. Well, it, I guess with any project, you're always going to have people who, who uh, you know, butt heads and don't get along and that sort of thing. And I know you're working on part two. Uh, when are you going to release that? And what is it that we're going to see in part two? You're going to see a lot more field action, things happening in real time. You get to see a few of those things in part one. Uh, Blake Deutscher catching this red eye shine, which I had never seen in my life. I've shined a lot of animals' eyes, and he actually catches two owls sitting on a log a little bit later on that I that's showed during the audio clip. And I'll make a note 
to look at this eyes, not this camera that's making these eyes red. This eye is red and it's big and it's eight feet off the ground. And he only caught a glimpse of it in real time, but the camera caught it most of the time. It was using a Psyonix color night vision camera. And uh, the, the, the creepy thing about it to me in this one thing, and I'll finish answering your question, is this eye does, the more he gets close to it, it doesn't get brighter. It's almost like it's self-illuminating, and I really hate to say that. That's just, that's hard to come out of my mouth. But when you look at the owls, the closer the light gets to them, because a science night vision is not just infrared, it's infrared and white light, or, or else you just don't have color. Um, the eyes get brighter as you get closer. With this thing, it wasn't really like that. It was so much different, and it's strange. And when you see it, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But more to, more to answer your question, there's a lot more field action, things happening in real time. Guys actually talking to the camera right after things happen. Uh, Blake catches this thing crossing just, uh, just out of the light, but you can still see it. It's dark crossing the path. It, what it is, who knows, but it's there. People can you know, decide for yourself what's there. Um, it's just uh, it's not going to be soon. I, I've got to take a break. Just I worked on the other one for so long. Uh, first of the year, part two will come and then we'll go back and we'll do it again because this wasn't done the way I wanted to do it. It just wasn't what I had envisioned. And that's more of what uh, we'll we'll see out of the next one we go and do is more of the vision that I had to put it together. But again, not having a frame of reference. And just having it there and trying to convey what you want to all these people when everyone has their own ideas is a, it's a difficult thing to do. So the next one will be there'll be more people in the background working instead That's of nice. just people in the field. There'll be an equal amount of people in the background working th as there will be in the field. Well, I can't wait to check out uh, part two and see some of the evidence. And going back to what you were just saying a moment ago, Kerry, uh, those eyes were glowing. <laughs> that was no eye shine I've ever seen. 100% those eyes were glowing red. Uh, but for the audience, definitely go and check it out. 168 hours on the Bigfoot Odyssey's YouTube channel. And I'll put a link underneath this episode so people can go and check it out that way too as well. Uh, definitely can't wait for part two. I'm glad to hear you're taking some time off because I know for about the last year, every time you and I talked, you were working on this film. Um, and check out some of uh, Kerry's other documentaries in there too as well. He's got some very cool documentaries in there. But Kerry, thank you so much for going down there to uh, put this together. I know it was a huge project, and I want to thank all the guys and gals that were down there uh, who were a part of the project. Uh, God bless you guys, because there's no way in hell I would be <laughs> I would be down there in the swamp uh, running around in that heat. But, Kerry, thank you so much for coming on, man. Yeah, thank you for having me, Wes. And just for the record, you know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. We stand on the shoulders of people like you that came, that did this before anybody uh, in, in this fashion. So we appreciate you very much. I copy you quite a bit. Appreciate the kind words. You'll be hearing from my attorney. <laughs> Thanks so much, Kerry. And for the audience, definitely go check it out. 168 hours. Link is below. And if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. To get a chance to check out sasquatchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.